Hi guys, welcome to Lecturing Ladies. This is episode three of season three. We're talking about kick-ass ladies through history. And this week I'm going to be talking about Hildegard von Biggen. She is known as the Sybil of the Rhine. Hildegard was born in 1098 in Bockelheim, West Franconia, which is current day Germany. It was a territory of the Holy Roman Emperor, Pyre. Empire and it's kind of it's like close to the border with France now so it's like kind of like a blend of those cultures um, and she was the youngest of at least seven children although possibly ten the records are a I little I love fuzzy. that at least at least, <laughs> at least like seven. you <laughs> okay. after seven we just you're like Always counting, counting. <laughs> which is fair I think um, I mean I you got imagine. one for every day of the week, and then you're like, there's some more, I think. After that, you're like, eh, I don't know. That one over there, that might be mine. I lost track. I have <laughs> two, and it's a lot, so I can't. Okay. <laughs> um, she was a German abbess, a visionary mystic, and a writer and composer. She was a Renaissance woman, although, ironically, she lived in the Middle Ages, which I thought was Ching! fun. Bing! She, from a young age, recalled having visions and premonitions uh, such as, like, what color a calf would be before it was born. And she started these visions when she was three years old. She started having them. And then by five years old, she had figured out kind of what was happening. Like, she realized they were visions. She told her parents she thought they were divine. So that's... By five years old. That's, that's a lot for a five-year-old. <laughs> that is a lot. That she, could either be really cool or really terrifying. I, like, it's scary enough. Like, my daughter sleepwalks, and when she was really little, it was kind of extra terrifying because you mm -hmm. just, like, go around a corner, and there's just, like, a little body standing there. Yep. So I can't imagine, like, a little person's like, oh, yeah, I have visions of spirits. And just like, no, nope, like, nope. no thanks. <laughs> nope. No, you don't. <laughs> Actually, no, you don't. <laughs> Shut your mouth. You did not see Graham all last night. And we're good on that field. here. We are we're high. good on that. And like, I just, mm, no, no, thank you. Uh, you're getting exercised, actually, and we're not talking about this anymore. <laughs> no, you know, happy ending has come from a little kid saying, I see visions in any movie. It's not happening. So in addition to having visions from God, she was also a sickly child. Um, and her parents were nobles, so she was supposed to have, like, a path in life. And with being a sickly child and also having visions, they thought, what better place to put her than in a, a monastery, essentially. Convent, monastery. I'm not totally sure what the difference is, but I'm sure there is one. I think there's one. Well, convent. I thought convents were for women. Con were, convents for uh, men. men. Yeah, that monasteries okay. are men, I think. Okay. I don't know. That's what okay, I thought. So, and then comments. Small step out. I'm a, I'm a little bit out on a limb, but I think that's right. That sounds right. That's, that's what right. I think it is. But also, some sororities are technically fraternities, so maybe some convents are technically monasteries. Who knows? There are no rules. Like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. There you go. Anyway, um, so by age, it, between the ages of eight and fourteen, we're not exactly sure. She ended up in a convent. And she was taught to read and write from a young age. Like I said, she was from nobility, so she would have had that privilege, at least even as a woman. Um, and with the convent, she also played an instrument known as the psaltery, which is this bad boy right here. If you, It's oh. like a triangle-shaped violin, kind of. Um, or, or like almost, it okay. reminds me of a lyre, like something like that. Yeah. I don't know. But she learned how to play that and some other instruments. And she was always told that her visions were sent from the Holy Spirit. So that's what she believed. And I mean, she's rich. Why convent. not? Yeah, sure. She's, she's fine. Uh, <laughs> she, in the convent, uh, grew up the ranks or, you know, however you want to state that um and after the previous leader died in 1136 she actually became she was voted as the leader um the patriarchal authority of the time of the church was wanted her to be under the thumb basically 
um, the Abbot Kuno of Dis Bodenberg asked her to be the prioress, which would have kept her under his authority, but Hildegard wanted more independence for herself and her nuns, so she asked him to allow her to move the monastery to Rupertsburg. And this was because the area where they were was not, you know, is not a great place, and it was basically a move from poverty in a stone complex that was, and a poverty in like just a rundown area to a stone complex that would have been well established. It was a better area for her and her nuns. And the abbot like really fought hard against that. I'm not totally sure why, but she went over his head and received the approval of the Archbishop of Mainz. And so the abbot got pretty pissed off, still wouldn't relent, and Hildegard been holding women down sounds yeah. unfamiliar. Totally. Thank God we don't concept. do that anymore. No, we have yeah. so moved on <laughs> since those middle ages. <laughs> Completely different now. So the abbot was unrelenting, and then Hildegard came down with an illness that kept her paralyzed and unable to move from her bed. And she attributed this to God's unhappiness at her not following his direction of moving the nuns to Rupertsburg. And it was only when the abbot himself also came down with this paralyzing illness that he decided that he would let them move because he didn't want the wrath of God, apparently, That's essentially. That sounds smart to not want the wrath of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of like a Ramses and Moses kind of thing. You're like, oh, yeah. I guess once it has affected me, I will let you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so her and about 20 of the nuns moved to Rupertsburg in 1150. And she set up a new monastery there. Convent. Whatever you want. A new... Uh, Religious house of... Yes. Whatever. A new house Religion. there. I like it. Religious house of religion. That's a technical <laughs> term? Um, I think so. so. Yeah. Everything I found said monastery, so I'm just going to go with that. Go with monastery. Um, and then in 1165, she also set up another, another monastery, um, which would have been technically the second one that she set up, but her third one that she was leading set that one up. In so she's like a franchise. Kind of. Yeah, she got her one little thing, and then she branched out. She's a local business. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, in 1141, so this was a little bit before the first move, she was inspired to begin writing about her visions. She was 43 by this time, and she consulted with higher members of the church, read that as men, um, who in turn reported the matter to the archbishop. And they had a whole, it was a whole thing, a committee of theologians had to confirm the authenticity of her visions and then a monk was appointed to help her record them in writing even though she could read and write i guess it was just you know a, a i mean you're helper. probably worn out after having a vision yeah, yeah and she also like throughout her life suffered from periodic illnesses she had like blinding migraines throughout her life which i can imagine if there's something you know if there's in her visions, brain, in visions, in your visions head. yeah she's She's got migraines, so she's a sickly person. So it is helpful for her to at least have someone to help her write her book, essentially. So the Pope at the time is Eugene the Third, and he reads an advanced copy of the manuscript, and he gives her Eugene, the papal. Seal. That has to be the nerdiest Pope name ever. Eugene the Third. Yes. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. I'll let you tell your story. <laughs> um. So he gives her the papal seal of approval, which is huge because it validates that her visions are indeed coming from the Holy Spirit. You know, they've had the whole committee throughout her life. They've been telling her this, but this is straight from the Pope. He's saying, yeah, these are visions from God, which is huge. Um, because you know, the Pope is Christ on earth. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not just the ravings of a madwoman. And as we all know, Catholicism is not particularly known for its... Uh, being a safe haven for feminists so it's it's really cool to me i think i know nothing else about eugene the third but good on him for doing this um 
don't know what else he might have done in his life. But she really garnered notoriety from this and credibility, like the church afterwards and all the other, uh, you know, people throughout the church, they, the men that she had pissed off in the meantime couldn't touch her, essentially, because she had the approval of the Pope and she was having visions from God. So what can you do? Suck it. I mean, metaphorically. <laughs> she really couldn't say that. Essentially. But also. She kind of did. But, um. We'll get to that in a minute. But the finished book is, uh, it's called Scivias, and it consists of 26 visions that are prophetic and apocalyptic, because of course they are, in form and in their treatment of such topics as the church and the relationship between God and humanity and redemption and all that stuff. Kind of sounds to me like she was recounting, like, Book of Revelation, kind of, you know, She's having these visions. She's saying, this is what the end of times is going to be. You know, this is how you need to act. That kind of stuff. Um, she said that <laughs> she was... Did she mention 2020? You know, I didn't see <laughs> that. And between her and Nostradamus, I'm really disappointed between both of them. Pretty much. But I've given us a warning. Um, she is known, though, to have told... Um, I'm not sure exactly who she told, but she said that perhaps God sent a woman these visions because he had sent them to men before and they had basically only screwed things up more. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, Put that well, on the t-shirt. Yeah. Okay, and a mug. And a billboard. Just yeah, saying. please. Start a religion around that one. So she is... At this point in her life, she's a talented poet. She's also a composer. She has written music and plays. She has collected, at this point, um, 77 of her lyrical poems and has set the music to them. And if you can hear it right now, this music, it's on Spotify, is stuff that she wrote. And we still have it today. Actually, apparently 69 of her pieces are still around today. Like, we have record of 69. Nice. She also has numerous other writings about saints, you know, uh, biographies about saints, treatises on medicine, botany, natural history. And also she would reflect on like the quality of scientific observation, which at that point in the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church is very rare and pretty frowned upon. <laughs> so, but she, even within the system, kind of moved in such a way that they couldn't touch her and she was still promoting her own ideals and helping the women that she was the protector of. So she was playing the system to her advantage even while being a part of that system, which is interesting to think about because, you know, even... Recently, there have been things like, oh, well, this person attended this college, so how could they stand against that? It's like, well, it's just the institution doesn't reflect the person that attended it. Just a thought to keep in mind. And she... But you um, see can still remove the plaque of Chad Wheeler anytime they choose. Yeah, please do. Please do we that. Have, we have no problem with that. <laughs> She'd have kicked his ass. So she's also renowned for her morality plays that she wrote, which is like an allegorical play that the protagonist is met by the personification of a moral attribute, and they have to choose between good and evil. So it's a pretty basic plot, but at the time, you know, and there's lots of different morals to go through, and it's written by a woman, so which is very different for the time. Um, she also wrote a letter to an emperor who had appointed the anti-pope, which if you don't know anything about the anti-pope, it's a whole thing. It like basically there were two popes for a good amount of time in in the Middle Ages uh, because they didn't mm -hmm. like each other. So she rival wrote, popes, rival yes. popes, it, exactly. Okay, um, it's a very interesting <laughs> church <laughs> history is a lot more interesting than you would think. Catholicism has like all the, the like. There's just too much. I need like a Cliff Notes version, please. 
Yeah. Um, and don't say the Bible because that's not it. That is no. not it. <laughs> Plus, they have extra little books in there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Y'all have extra stuff, bro. And that's subjective. There's, a, there's yeah. a whole set of rules that I don't have that I need you to let me in on. Yeah. So, so go look up stuff about the anti-popes because it's pretty funny. But anyway, she wrote a letter to the new emperor who had appointed the anti-pope at the time and called him, quote, a totally insane man. Which is really funny to me. <laughs> um, she is, uh, later in her life, like I said before, she had pissed off a lot of men on the, her way to where she got. The church tried to have her monastery banned from singing, playing music. You know, I'm sure there were accusations of debauchery mm-hmm. and witchcraft mm-hmm. and all that fun stuff. And she basically said, fuck that. And kept doing it and they essentially just had to give up (laughs) trying to stop her because they couldn't and her monasteries kept singing and playing and doing what they wanted to do she also created her own language called lingua ignata which she's doing the most so much the most (laughs) this language is I haven't based even on put Latin. my groceries up today. <laughs> like, right? You gotta create a whole ass language. Like, yeah. let me just do the dishes and fill it up. I have a lot of Aldi bags out in the mudroom that have been there for two days. <laughs> it's like, it's freezing overnight. They're fine in the car. Yeah. <laughs> They're good. And, you know, it's like a fridge out there. <laughs> She's like writing poems and plays and language while paralyzed. Yeah. yeah. And having visions and migraines. And, and blinding and- migraines and. She is. Let's not forget a, she's a woman in like 1000 yeah. whatever year. I don't even remember. Yeah, like yeah. 1100s. There uh, you go. Not uh, to be looked down upon. So she, the language is based on Latin and she would just throw it, like sprinkle it into her poetry and her lyrics and stuff. It The, the language has like its own, you can look it up and learn it. Like I you know go for that if that's what you want to do <laughs> but what if we learned um, it what if just the like, three of us learned it <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> it's like oh, on twitter that. completely talking crap about people and they won't even know google translate don't work for that language i about guarantee it you can speak klingon well i got lingua ignata bitch <laughs> what <laughs> yes that's a that's a thought so in addition to everything else she's doing. She's also traveling widely throughout the area of Germany, evangelizing large groups of people, which is, you know, feel how you want about evangelicals, but she's spreading her thoughts and her religion. She's sharing her visions with people, her religious insights. She's spreading the word of God. Um, her earliest biographer proclaimed her a saint and not that they have the power to, but you know what I mean? Like they, they were like, yeah, this, this woman's going to be a saint and miracles were reported during her life. And later on at the site of her tomb, um, there so are, is she, a saint? she is, oh, actually. Sorry. I, okay. um, there are more surviving chants songs by Hildegard than by any other composer from the entire Middle Ages, and she's one of the few known composers to have written both the music and the words. Wow. And like I said, if you can still hear it going in the background, she wrote there's, I love that it's on Spotify. That's my favorite part. It's just like yeah. And on YouTube, there's a, a like a parody channel that does mashups between her music and like Taylor Swift and like other popular artists and it's called Hildegard von Blingen instead of Bingen. It's got, like, sunglasses and stuff. Funny. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I'm just covered in knowing there's nerdier people than me out there. The internet's a really fun it. place. There will always be someone nerdier. Um, and then there's also me that listens to it. So, there you go. So, uh, some of her pieces go up to two and a half octaves in range. And if you know anything about music, that's a crazy lot. It's basically... Mariah Carey, this is yours and no one else's. Like, no one else can do this by themselves. And her music is really ethereal. It just reminds you of, appropriately, of, like, sitting in a church. Like, even, um, like, Home Alone, when he's sitting in the church and just the choir is going in the background. And, like, you just, 
I don't know. It's really, it's calming. Um, I like it. It's pretty cool. She viewed music as the trumpets of God's breath. She said, quote, music stirs our hearts and engages our souls in ways we cannot describe. When this happens, we are taken beyond our earthly banishment back to the divine melody Adam knew when he sang with the angels. So she, her, her connection to God came through her music, which is pretty interesting. She died September 17th, 1179. She was, I forget, I didn't write down the exact age, but like in her 80s, which is crazy. Christ almighty. Yeah. For Especially the for Middle then. Ages. Then, yeah. I thought they died at like 22. Like, see, it's been good. Yeah. Um, Unless you're and, a saint and God needs to keep you around a little longer. And that's, sure. she wrote um, a letter to some, some, I forget, some archbishop or something when she was like 77 saying like, I've been sickly my whole life, you know, everything... I shouldn't have lived past like 10, but God has sustained me this long and he'll keep sustaining me as long as he needs to. And it's a pretty good argument. You know, she lived that long with that in that condition, you know, um, she was beatified in August of 1326, which is, I had no idea what this meant. It's recognition accorded by the Catholic Church of a deceased person's entrance into heaven and the capacity of that person to intercede on behalf of individuals to, who pray to them. So essentially, it's the Catholic Church's official recognition that, yeah, she's in heaven and she can hear your prayers and will intercede as she sees fit. So that was 150-ish years after her death. Uh, not a math pod. But... um. I found that interesting that it took that long. And I, maybe there's like a time constraint. They have to Can't wait. They have what? to wait a certain amount of time. But I don't yeah. know. I don't think it's under 50 years. But also it might have changed. You know women. Because I remember when Mother Teresa died, they were like, make her a saint like the next day. And the Catholic mm -hmm. Church was like, no, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So... She was not canonized until May 10th, 2012, when Pope Benedict XVI declared her saint through the process of equivalent canonization, which is the papal proclamation of canon canonization based on a standing tradition of popular veneration. So essentially, he's like, yeah, everyone sees her as one anyway, so she's a saint. Yeah. <laughs> you, Just, you get in, because everyone thinks you're in already. So yeah, we, we got it. Unlike Basically. you, bird shilling. Unlike you. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing it wasn't 2021. No one gets into heaven. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> we're all living in hell. So I was trying to say. That's true. That's true. Feels kind of right right now, actually. Uh, final fun fact. She's one of only four women to be named a doctor of the church and is considered a patron saint of musicians and writers. So she is a very interesting figure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, as far as the Middle Ages go, I was this close to picking Eleanor of Aquitaine. And if you don't know her, definitely go look her up. She was queen of England and France at the same time. She was a badass in her own right. But I feel like more people know about her. So I was like, you know what? I've never heard of this Hildegard von Bingen. Um, so I'm going to talk about her. And I just found it interesting that her music is so prevalent even today yeah like it's still that is wild that is still yeah it's just like let and me look up like on the middle oh, ages yeah. on spotify it's on <laughs> earth somewhere and like you can go find it yeah. like you know how like there's books in the library of congress that the only copy in the whole world is the one that's there so yeah. like yeah technically that book survived but like did it really because you can't read it yeah like, can't no one knows it. About we can't it. look at it so right. the fact that it's like on spotify and her cool. language is online where you can learn it yeah, yeah, so like that's even more different. amazing, honestly. Because you think about how many people like made up their own like little like play language or whatever, mm -hmm. and like she made up a whole railroad and yeah. they've preserved it. We've Take almost that. lost whole talking. languages of like races of people. Yeah, like people yeah, that there are <laughs> plenty of people, and she's one person, and her's still around. Yeah, I want to so, know how 
hard it is because when you said based on or off of or whatever latin you really got me like yeah yeah okay. she kind Maybe. of from what i read she like would just add like different really inflections and different form. endings and stuff just to make it sound more exotic i have <laughs> um uh, i'm the girl with the latin tattoos not the girl who understands uh, yeah you know there's a difference I took not the three same. years of yeah. Latin, and I know my prefix is pretty much, and that's yeah. where it ends. We never had Latin in high school, so we only have French. Yeah, we, Spanish, so. we had it in middle school, and then in college. I took it in college. We had, but then I switched to Portuguese, because I literally went to my advisor and said, what language do the athletes take? Latin's getting too hard. And yeah. you switch languages. <laughs> and she was like, you can take Swahili or Portuguese. And I was like... Portuguese has Brazilian. Let's go there. Like, yeah. There we go. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, she's... there's a book yeah. that teaches you. Oh, oh, never mind. Yeah. There's not actually a book that's attainable. The book to learn her language is $115 on Amazon. Oh. Um, so that's on Wikipedia. let's put that on Steve Cohen's gift list. No, we can do it. Not. You know what? Um, we shit about that GameStop and we were. We could have no been so good. Yeah, I've been like, hell yeah, I'll spend $150 on it. I'm going to buy all three copies left. Fuck all you other people. (laughs) (laughs) It's me and my friend. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and she has other works, like the, whatever the name of her actual, like, Book of Visions, Excavaris, or whatever it was. Um, That, I think, is available, like, that's been translated to English. She's got two other well-known, higher-ranking um books that she wrote and it's she's still got shit that we can consume today and i think that's pretty cool hopefully someone in 900 years is still listening to our podcast hey that would be pretty cool (laughs) that would be pretty cool that would that is hildegard von bingen check her out on spotify (laughs) and check her out on youtube like and subscribe. Hildegard <laughs> von Blingen. Von Blingen. Oh my gosh. It's okay. <laughs> See you next week, guys. Bye. Bye.